Hello and welcome to a chapter on network cabling. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about the basic transmi uh, data transmission concept. So we'll discuss um, what is data modulations, what's multiplexing, what's the difference between bandwidth and throughput, and what's the difference on what is baseband and broadband communications. Then we'll get into the cables. We'll talk about the unshielded twisted pair cable, the shielded twisted pair cable, the coax, and the fiber optic cables that are out there. And uh, what are the benefits and uh, what are the disadvantages and how to protect them? And when do you need, when do you use one over the other and, and so on. And then we'll compare, um, and then we'll talk about some troubleshootings towards the end. All right, so let's talk about some transmission basics. Um, we'll start out with analog signal. An analog signal is a signal that is continuous. That's the buzzword for it. It's a continuous wave that uh, when the transmitter transmits every in an infinite amount of voltages over a period of time. All right, so please write that down. I want you to write down, I want you also to know the difference between amplitude, frequency, wavelength, and phase. So I'll discuss those in a, in a second, so please write those down. So with an analog signal such as this, you know, this is when you, when the signal rises, see it is every single infinite amount of time, there you are submitting, you are sending um, a voltage till it reaches to maximum and it starts to go down. If the signal just goes from here to here, that is just a positive, and then it reverses. That's why we call it an alternating current. For example, if it was alternating current, it goes into the positive, then it changes direction to the bottom for the same amount. So this is called one cycle when you go from here to here, right? And then the cycle repeats. If you get uh, if you are, if you transmission wirelessly, let's say you're transmitting something wirelessly, a wave such as this, okay, the, the antenna will radiate a signal like that. You can think of it, um, if you want to think about how the antenna, uh, a wireless antenna radiates the signal, if you take a, a stick and hit a puddle of water and you get the waves, right, coming out. That's kind of how the antenna radiates the signal in omnidirectional, in all directions. Um, how high the wave is, that's called the amplitude. The higher the amplitude, the longer it's going to travel, but then as it travels, the signal will attenuate. Attenuates means dying out. So the stronger the signal, the more power you give it, the bigger the amplitude. That's what amplitude is. Um, how many of these cycles occur in one second is the frequency. So if you get a lot of cycles in one second, that's a higher frequency. So a 2.4 gigahertz, the word hertz means cycles per second. How many cycles occur in one second? We use the word hertz after um, an electrical engineer that contributed a lot into um, his theories and things uh, into the electrical engineering field, such as Tesla and Ohms and all of those, and Amperes and Pascal, all of these electrical engineers for their contributions. We use their name as their units to certain um, character or certain uh, such as um, current, voltage, and, and so on. Anyway, um, to continue. So the frequency is cycles per second, or we use the word hertz. How many cycles occur in one second? So 2.4 gigahertz means the, you have your phone, for example, or, or your wireless router is sending out 2.4 billion cycles in one second. Now, each cycle can carry data for you. So the higher the frequency, the more data, the higher the bandwidth, the more data rates you're going to get, the higher the bandwidth, right? And uh, But as the, the higher the frequency, the faster it attenuates. And uh, if you go very, very high, the higher the frequency, it will not go through walls. So uh, for example, up to five gigahertz, you can go through walls. When you go much higher than that, for example, the 60 gigahertz, 
802.11, I think, D, if I'm not mistaken, the new um, protocol that's out there. It operates at 60 gigahertz. That doesn't go through walls. That's within the room, but it gives you a, it gives you a tremendous amount of um, a tremendous amount of data rates, a tremendous amount of bandwidth, and it's typically used for virtual reality and things like that. All right, so frequency is how many cycles of these occur in one second. If you measure from trough to trough, how far is this? That's called the wavelength, right? So a wavelength is the measure of one cycle, right? If you take a meter and you measure one cycle from here to here or trough to trough, that will tell you how many, um, that's what a wavelength is. And um, the period is the time it takes, right? That's the period. One over the period tells you the frequency. Uh, what else do you need to know? Phase. Phase is really relative to a reference. So if this is was the original signal that was transmitted, right? And on the receiving end, you received it starting at this point, at the point 25. That means you are leading, right? The phase is 0.5. If you're behind, you're lagging. So the phase, it's either front or behind. If you are in phase, that means you were received exactly at the same point that was transmitted at zero, right? So typically when you receive, you are usually out of phase and you want to be in phase. Um, that's how you get your FM, ra FM radios do that using phase lock loop. They try to log into the phase. All right. So um, here's the different phase. For example, if this is the reference, this guy is leaning, leading. If it's behind, it, the red signal is leading the blue. If the blue was the reference, that's the phase difference. The phase difference is whatever from here to here. All right. The problem with sending analog signal is that it's it's susceptible. Excuse me, it's susceptible to noise, uh, especially on the amplitude. So as the signal travels, the amplitude really gets corrupted, and that's why, for example, in AM radios, you can hear the hissing sound, and you won't get a clear picture. The voice could, you know, you could hardly hear it because there's so much noise in it. Um, so that is really a problem with that. Now, what you could do is you could use digital signal. So what is digital signal? Digital signal, the buzzword is discrete. So please write that down. Digital signals is positive, a one or a zero. You're either sending a one or a zero. And the way it works is, let me just go back on the previous um, slide. What you're going to do, let me just go back one more. All right, so if this is the signal that you want to transmit, you don't want to send this signal out because of the susceptible to noise and you're sending a, it, it's going to require a lot of bandwidth because it's, you know, you're sending a lot of data because every single microsecond you're sending voltages. That's what you're doing. So what you're going to do is there was a, another engineer called, his name was Nyquist, and he decided, he says, it, it's better to, for every cycle to take two samples and let's say I'm going to take a sample right here. So if this is five volts, I'm going to send an eight bit number. If this is a four volts, I'm going to send a different eight bit number. So he assigned an eight bit number. He took for every cycle, he will take two samples and send um, a binary number out. So when you get that on the other end, when you get these codes, you read the codes, and you just, uh, you know, put the dots and just connect the dots to redraw the analog signal. So you're, with digital, what you're doing is, this is called an ADD converter, an analog to digital converter. You're taking two samples for each cycle. Each sample is eight bits. And if you have to send, because your voice is 4,000 cycles per second in general, so what you're going to transmit is 4,000 cycles, two samples per cycle, and each cycle is eight bits. So 8,000 times two, I'm sorry, eight bits times, because each, uh, each sample is eight bits. So eight bits times two, that's 16, 16 times 4,000, you get 64 kilobits per second, 64,000 bits per second. That's the digital, digital signal zero. So, a digital signal is really, you're, you're really sending ones and zeros. 
Now, you could do that on a wire, but wirelessly, you don't send ones and zero. You have to still send an analog signal. So what you're going to do is you're going to mimic a digital signal using amplitude shift keying ASK. In other words, if you, have, you send out high voltage, high amplitude for a one, low analog for zero. High for one, low for zero and amplitude that's called amplitude shift keying so um, it looks like you know it's still an analog signal but it looks like digital you can the the modem on the other end will convert that ones ones to zeros but for now when on the wire you can send you know a whole you know a voltage of five volts then don't send anything for a certain amount of time that would be a zero that's uh, that's what uh, digital signals are and this is taking the um this is the digital signal, so you can either go, this is a one, you want to send another one, just keep going higher if you want to keep sending a one. Okay, data modulations. Data modulations is to converting digital to data, uh, digital to analog. That's what modulation means, so please write that down. Uh, modulation means um, modifying the digital signal into digital data and vice versa, right? making analog signals su suitable to digital data over a communication path. In the old plain old telephone systems, um, we wanted to, for example, when first the internet came around, we wanted to connect the whole world together. But the only problem is, um, the only way to use it, the easiest way is to use the existing telephone systems that is interconnected I would say probably over 98% of the world was connected through the old plain old telephone system. But these devices that interconnected all the telephone system we used analog signals. So if you send out data, these devices that interconnected everything expected an analog signal to go through. But the computers at the time were digital. So they were sending out ones and zeros. You can't use these analog signals, they won't work. So what we did is we created a modem, an MO for modulation. So what we're gonna do is, before the computer sends out the ones and zeros, you send it to the modem and it will modulate the signal, convert the digital to analog, send it out so it can go through the old telephone systems, a plain old telephone, you know, through the wiring. And when it gets to the destination, you demodulate. That's what the DEM is for. You demodulate, convert it from analog back to um, ones and zeros. Okay, so a modem is to can write that down as well. A modem is used to modulate and demodulate the signal. Right. Nowadays, everything is in. Um, is in the digital world, so there is really no need for modems anymore. Anyway, a carrier wave. <clears throat> Typically, the voice it has a very weak signal, low, maybe in it will even take like texting in kilobits per second. If you want to send it far away, you need to, to send it with a higher frequency. So, uh, if you like the radio signals that comes out, for example, here in our tri-state area in New York out of the Empire State Building, what they do is they take the voice and they mix it with a carrier signal, a much higher frequency. So if you listen to an FM radio station such as 100.3, that's the carrier signal, 100.3 megahertz. And with it is carrying the signal from the, uh, from the station. So what your radio is going to do is going, when you, um, when you tune into 100.3, it's going to filter out the voice, right? Is that's just the carrier that's being sent out, the carrier, and you send it out with a tremendous amount of power that can cover, you know, miles and miles. Um, but when you carry it, uh, when your, your your radio will be able to filter out the voice. All right, um, that's the information wave. So. Frequency modulation is, instead of taking the amplitude modulation, by the way, remember I said you send a high amplitude of five volts for a one, send no amplitude a frequency for a zero. That's called amplitude modulation. You could, but that's susceptible to noise. That's what AM radio does. Uh, 
But if you, you, you could do is use frequency modulation, FM. And what you're going to do is, for example, send a high frequency. Keep the amplitude the same. High frequency for a one, low frequency for a zero. Uh, because you're keeping the amplitude the same, that's less susceptible to noise. And so you get much clearer signal when you are when you're using FM FM signal, uh, FM transmission, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, FM transmission, the frequency modulation. Um, and it carries more data for you because you can use higher frequencies uh, and you can get stereo. Stereo for FM is really sending the same voice twice on in just with a slight difference in timing. Okay. DSL also uses some sort of modulation to send the data on the telephone signal. On the on the old telephone on telephone wire. All right, so uh, here's the carrier. For example, has a higher frequency than the information wave, the voice. When you mix it together, you'll get something like this. See higher frequency for a one, for example, low different frequency for a zero. You can think of it that way. Okay, baseband. Here's what I want you to know. You know, baseband means you're sending one signal carries the data. So when you see uh, at 100 base T, the 100 means that NIC is 100 megabits per second. The word base means one signal is sending out the data. T stands for uh, that NIC needs a twisted pair cable connect uh, to be connected to it. The word broadband means multiple signal is multiple signals are carrying the data for you. Uh, not just one frequency, multiple frequencies, right? So please write that down, at least the first bullet point for baseband and broadband. You want broadband, right? Because if you have multiple frequencies carrying data for you, uh, you're going to get a higher throughput, right? Multiplexing. So let's say um, multiplexing is when you have, it's like um, having one connection, and um, uh, one cable that all the data has to be to go onto this trunk on this cable to a specific destination. So there'll be a multiplexer that you go to the multiplexer and you'll get your turn to use that trunk, that cable, that backbone cable to get to your final destination. Uh, we call it a multiplexer. So here's a, so please write down what multiplexing is, is a form of transmission that allows multiple signals to travel simultaneously over one medium, one cable. And here's a typical multiplexer. For example, he's a multiplexer and you get signal A, B, or C. So after a certain amount of time, if it's TDM, time division multiplexing, meaning each one of those inputs will get a certain amount of time to use this trunk. So A will be send, then B, then C, then they're just taking turns. Now, the problem with TDM, what happens if B and C don't want to send data? A will send, let's say, for two seconds, and then he has to wait another four seconds where no one is using the cable, and then he gets his turn. That's not efficient. So what we do is we use statistical multiplexing, where um, A will start sending uh, data. If B and C are not using it, he'll just keep sending. That's what really um, statistical TDM means, and this is the most widely used. All the plain old telephone system uses this, um, even GSM phones. So if you have a T-Mobile phone that uses GSM, they use this, but they do it on the wirelessly. So there is a multiplexing that allow you to use the same frequency wirelessly. All right, uh, FDM, frequency division multiplexer. Well, with the good thing with FDM, everybody travels at the same time. Nobody gets turned. It's not time division. It's frequency division, which means everybody will have a different frequency, but they all go on the same medium. This is like your old cable uh, TV. They mix all the channels. For example, this would be channel two. This would be HBO. This may be Netflix. I don't know. And they are all the signals are on different frequencies. And on the other end, you'll just filter them out. Depending, you know, if you choose, if you tune into HBO, you'll just tune into a specific frequency and you'll get that signal. That's FDM. 
uh, you could use it with fiber optic. If this is if the trunk is fiber optic, you can also mix the light waves same way, and you demultiplex them on the other end. This is the wavelength division multiplexing specifically. So the wavelength, the length of the wave, or the frequency, really doesn't matter. I mean, they sometimes they call it WDM, depending on how you know the length of the wave. That's uh, that's the detector on the other end to really uh, filter out the specific frequency that you're getting. Okay, dense wavelength, that means you use most often in fiber optic networks that you can have a lot of frequency, a lot of frequencies going in. And uh, the coarse wavelength diffusion multiplexing, that's also gives you channels that are spaced out more widely apart across the entire frequency band. Okay, so this is will give you a lot much higher bandwidth. This is what is used to get the you know the 10 gigabit, the 40 gigabit um, bandwidth. All right, I know we've discussed this before, but I want you to write this down again in terms of the def definition with the difference between bandwidth and throughput. Bandwidth is the difference between the highest and the lowest frequency in a medium can transmit. This is, by the way, the definition for um, an analog bandwidth. So if somebody says, what is the analog bandwidth? You know, it's the difference between the high and the low frequency. What frequencies are allowed to travel inside this medium, inside this cable? So if you have a coax cable and you got cable TV coming into your house, and if you got, you know, the channel, the channels are between 500, you know, uh, 20 megahertz and 500 megahertz. So your bandwidth is 480. And what's the frequencies between them that can travel? It's between 20 and 500, right? That's the bandwidth. The throughput is the actual data that's, but for digital, on the other hand, is the maximum amount of bits that you can transmit, right? Just like I said to you in a, in a different lecture, it is the, um, how many bits per second, like a speed limit on a highway. Throughput is the actual data that's being transmitted, right? The actual speed. All right, so for digital data, here's the throughput and uh, kilobits. I just want you to remember kilobits is a thousand, mega is a, a million, giga is a billion, and tera is a trillion. And remember, the first letters in K, M, G, and T should be capital. The Bs should be lowercase. Everything else should be lowercase. If you put a capital B, for example, megabytes, it will, if you put a capital B, everybody will interpret that as bytes and not bits. A byte is an eight bit. So make sure when you're writing throughput or bandwidth, um, the units should be in lowercase, except the first letter. Okay. Twisted pair cables. What is a twisted pair cables? Before we can before we continue with explaining that, um, getting into that, if you take a wire, a copper wire, which is metal, and you put next to it on one end of the cable, if you put a magnet, just bring it close enough to the wire the electrons inside that copper wire because it's a conductor will start to move you're conducting electricity and those electrons will have a potential to do work for you okay and on the other end you want to continue the cycle because otherwise they'll start to die out because of the resistance of the wire they start to die out so you want to keep pumping it all right so because of that invisible electromagnetic wave that was induced by the magnet to move the electrons you get electricity now when the electrons to move the good thing about it is they also emit the same electromagnetic force that was induced on them right a wave believe it or not that's the wireless wave that we're talking about okay and also you generate heat so if there's a lot of electrons moving you're going to generate a tremendous amount of heat so you got to make sure that the wire can handle that kind of heat and you don't want to you don't want a lot of electrons moving so if you get a short circuit why do you get fire because short circuit you're getting an infinite amount almost 
like an avalanche amount of electrons moving and because they're generating so much heat, pff, the wire might burst uh, and, you know, fire will. And so that's a fire. That's why we get circuit breakers. So once they sense in a short circuit, they immediately break the, break the circuit and don't let the electrons flow. All right, now, because electrons are moving, they emit an electromagnetic wave. If you put another wire next to, a wire that's not even conducting electricity, just a regular wire next to a wire that's live, that other wire that came next to them will start to conduct. So if there is data on another wire next to another wire, the data is going to be corrupted because of the electromagnetic interference that's emitted by the adjacent wire. So what we're going to do is, if, by the way, if the data is coming towards you, the electromagnetic wave is, is spinning in counterclockwise. If the data is going away from you, the electromagnetic wave that's emitted by the wire is going in a clockwise direction. If you have two wires, one is sending data away from you and one sending data towards you, the electromagnetic waves that's emitted by both wires will cancel themselves out and therefore the data will be okay. They will not sense any electromagnetic interference from each other. So we could do this if we change the direct, if we twist the wires, what we're doing is we're changing the direction of the current so that the electromagnetic that waves that are transmitted, um, uh, that are radiated outward will cancel themselves out. So if someone asks you why in the unshielded twisted pair cables do we twist the wire, the reason is to eliminate electromagnetic interference that's emitted by the wires. Sometimes we call that crosstalk or noise. So in an unshielded twisted pair cable, we twist the wires, there are four pairs, right? We can use, you know, two of them to transmit and receive, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay. All right. So uh, the more twi the more twist and pair per foot, the more resistant to crosstalk. So if you twist them more, the less electromagnetic interference and the higher the quality and more expensive they are. So there are much, there are hundreds of different designs in twisted pair cables that are out there. The biggest standard that controls them is the TIA, EIA, the Telecommunication Industry Association, along with the Electronics Industry Associations have the standard 568 um, for the unshielded twisted pair cables. And there are plenty of categories. CAT3 is used for the old telephone system. Five enhanced, category five enhanced is the most widely deployed. They can handle up to a thousand megabits per second. Please write that down by the way, because that's the most widely used CAT5E up to a thousand megabits per second, which is a gigabit. Uh, the distance that the data can travel on a CAT5E is 100 meters. And, um, well, that's, and it's mostly used for the Ethernet. CAT6, 7, and 8, this is really, if you go into, you know, you use 7, they're a little bit more expensive. This is for the gigabit Ethernet, up to 10 gigabit. If you still want to use copper, uh, it's a little bit cheaper than to maintain and even to install than fiber, but fiber provides you almost unlimited amount. If you uh, in ba bandwidth, if you really want to go, if you to expand later down the road. All right, so the advantages of uh, twisted pair cables, they are inexpensive, really cheap to make and to buy and, and it's most widely using gigabit ethernets you know, you can get almost like gigabit bandwidth. That would be great. Um, and uh, easy to maintain, troubleshoot, to install. There are two different types of twisted pair cables. There is the shielded twisted pair and the unshielded. Unshielded meaning they, they are unshielded from outside electromagnetic interference. Shielded, they put a a copper wire, uh, threaded wire uh, 
around the those four pairs of twisted pair cables to shield them from outside interference. But the problem with that is the um, the distance is then drops to like 25 meters instead of 100 meters because of because of the um, there's some capacitance and issues with um, shielding the uh, shielding them from outside interference. Okay, so here's the braided copper wire that actually shield the twisted pair from outside interference. Um, these are the twisted pair cables. Hardly anybody uses them anymore. In the old days, Token Ring used to use uh, an STP. But if you worried about outside interference, go and use fiber. That's probably your only choice. So uh, if your wires that you're going to run through machine. Let's say you're hooking up a network in um, a manufacturing warehouse where there's a lot of machinery, electromagnetic, you know, um, electromechanical devices that emit a lot of electromagnetic interference and the wires have to go past them. You're going to get a lot of interference and the corrupted data. So the best thing that you could do is um, use fiber if you need to run your wires for example across transmission lines you probably need to use wire uh, fiber because the you know the transmission lines also emit a tremendous amount of electromagnetic interference and will corrupt your data okay so here's a the casing outside for the unshielded twisted pair cable again you are not shielded from the outside world right here's your four pairs you cut the jacket and like i told you i think on the last you uh do not because you need to put all these eight wires into an rj45 connector make sure you do not unwind them a lot because what you're going to end up doing is you're going to create a near cross near end cross and that's the next right so try to not unwind them as much as you can Okay. All right. So let's continue. Um, this is a typical CAT6 cable. This is the 5E cables. This is the plenum. This is to protect it from fire, just in case. That's what the plenum is for. Right? So the throughput for STP and UTP, um, they're probably the, pretty much the same rate, up to one. Uh, one gigabits per second. The cost of STP is a little bit more expensive than UTP. The connectors, they still use the same RJ45 connectors. Um, here, the biggest difference is um, STP is protected from outside electromagnetic interference. Um, but UTP is the most widely used because most, you know, most buildings where organizations are, there's not a lot of um, electromagnetic interference unless you're going to go through maybe um i don't know next to an elevator shaft your wires have to go through so you probably cannot use an unshielded twisted ca bare cable or even stp probably the only way to go to do that is to go through fiber all right they're both scalable and um, and again up to 100 meters they can go without transmission all right, so um, here's what I want you to write when it comes down. You don't have to write the whole thing, but I want you to know the different parts of the standard, the naming. The first part, the number 10, indicates the bandwidth. So in this case, a 10 means a 10 megabits per second. A 100 means 100 megabits per second. A 1,000 means a 1,000 megabits per second, okay? The second part is called the signaling. Okay, so write that down as well. The signaling means it's either going to be base, which stands for baseband, or broadband. Baseband means, this is all for Ethernet, by the way. It's, Ethernet is always a baseband communication. The, a baseband signaling means one frequency is going to be transmitted. The last part is what type of media. T stands for twisted pair. TX we, really means... Uh, to achieve a thousand megabits, this is like multiplexing the signal to achieve a higher rate. Nobody really uses this TX. There is an old 100 TX2. Go for 
Ethernet. Here's one thing I want you to remember with uh, the last part. If you see the letter T or C, it's always a copper wire. Any other letter at the end other than T or the letter C, as in Charlie, then it's a fiber optic cable. Okay, so you may see the letter Z, LX, RX, whatever. It's always fiber. If it's T, it's twisted pair. It's a copper wire. All right, and uh, and that's that. All right, so the pinouts. There are two different standards, the 568A and 568B. There is really no difference in between them. So, uh, the only thing that I want you to remember is Ethernet transmits data at pins one and two and receives at five and six. And I'm sorry, not five and six, three and six. All right. You should follow the pinouts, you know, um, <clears throat> white, orange, orange for the first number two pairs, number one pairs are blue and white, blue. So this is you transmit on these two pins. And you receive on two the on these two pins. I'm sorry, you. Uh, I'm sorry, on this pair, one and two. Pins one and two, you transmit. Pins one and two, and you receive at three and six, the greenies, right? Um, typically, what you what you're going to do if you if you remember both 568A and 560B, B, here's another here's another thing that I want you to write down. If you insert these according to 568A into an RJ45 and insert on the other end of the wire a 568B, the wires, according to the, um, the color code, then you have a crossover cable. So a crossover cable, if you use 568A on one end, 568B on the other end. If you use the same standard on both ends, it doesn't matter, A or A on both sides or B on both sides, then you have a straight through cable. So we'll talk about the straight through and what does it mean? Straight through cable is when you have pin one on one end is exactly the same color code on pin one on the other end. Pin two is the same as pin two, pin three, pin three. So whatever is sending on pin one, it goes all the way to pin one on the other end. Straight through cables are used to connect this similar devices. Typically, when you always just remember this for now, when you are connecting your PC to a switch, you need a straight through cable. The switch to a router, dissimilar devices, you are going from, um, you're going to use a straight through cable, right? Um, if Let's say if you want to connect a NIC to a NIC directly to each other, there are similar devices right? The NICs. So therefore, you're going to need a crossover because when you are sending, if you use a straight through cable, imagine you're going to use a straight through cable to directly connect two PCs together. So PC1 is going to send the data at pins one and two. Now, because you're, you have a using a straight through cable, on the other end, it's going to be received at pins one and two, right? Not good. So it should be received at three and six. So that's why you need to use a crossover cable. Pin one and two is going to be received on the other end at three and six. And a PC two, when he transmits at pins one and two, PC one will receive it at three and six. So crossing over is when you, you cross over when you use it to connect to similar devices, such as switch to switch or PC to PC. We hardly ever use it because we always have a switch in between to connect them. Rollover cable is when you have pin one connects to pin eight, pin two connects to pin seven, pin three connects to pin six and so on. And it's used primarily for um, to connect a PC or a laptop to a Cisco router or switch for, um, for, um, for configuration purposes to connect to the console port. And we will use them in class to show you how to do that as well. All right, so here's what I want you to write down. Straight through is used for dissimilar devices, such as connecting a PC to a switch. Crossover is used for similar devices, such as PC to PC or switch to switch. Rollover cable is 
is used to connect from a PC serial port to a route to a Cisco router or switch console port and it's used for configure to configure the switch or the router all right a media converter let's say you have for example an RJ45 connection you know a copper wire data coming in this media converter converts the data into light and you can connect it through fiber for example so it connects uh, an unshielded with, with pair cable to a fiber that's what a media converter for so write that down a coupler is all you know uh passes data through a homogeneous connections with add mod modification it's just like a repeater power over ethernet uh this is to innate to give you to send power on one of the twisted pair cable wires uh to power a device on the other end okay um, switch will all uh, has the ability to do that power those features in the switches and most widely they are used uh, what they do is they go out for example if you connect an, a voice over IP phone to the switch right so the switch if it has a, the feature of power over Ethernet it's going to go and check to see if that device that's connected to the port uh, needs power and he, if that device is capable of receiving power and what it does it will use one of the wires to send power to it the advantages of that is the the phone does not need a power outlet so you could put it on and in fact you can actually go to the phone and from phone you can go to your pc connected to the same port on the switch and uh, so if the data is going to the phone you'll be able to use your phone if it's not for the phone it'll just you know the, it will bypass that and go to your pc so you can have the pc and the phone in other words connect it, connected in a daisy chain manner connected to the same port on the switch all right so fiber optic cables fiber optic cables here's what i want you to know about fiber write the following notes down number one fiber is made out of plastic or um glass and they are extremely thin um the core where the actual data transmit that's point number two can be as small as five micron a micron m-i-c-r-o-n is one over a millionth of a meter your the width of your hair is 200 micron so we're talking about a fiber that is 40 times thinner than the width of your hair. You can't see it, but it can carry a tremendous amount of data for you. Um, so what we do is we cover the core with what we call cladding so that the light doesn't escape. It can stay inside the, um, the fiber. That's number two. Number three, um, the bandwidth is so far unlimited let's put it that way higher than 100 gigabit per second so we're talking about an unlimited almost amount of bandwidth immune from electromagnetic interference so you can run it any way you want and not have to worry about data corruptions point number five um very difficult very secured because it's uh, immune also from eavesdropping nobody can tap the wire and sense the data that's running you know on an unshielded twisted pair cable because it's emitting radiation you can actually figure out what the data that's flowing without cutting the wire but with fire because nothing is emitted outward because light is traveling in the fiber um, so it's immune also from eavesdropping unless they cut the wire and if they cut the wire they lose connection uh, long distance so if you uh, if if you run a, a fiber optic cable and it goes for it can travel up to 62 and a half miles if you, there's not a lot of twists because if you the more twists you have the more light will be able to will be um, more more light will escape and the distance will be shorter you won't be able to tell you won't be able to differentiate between the ones and the zeros 
Um, the so there's a lot of advantages. The problem with fiber, the disadvantages, write this down as well, is it's expensive to install and maintain. You know, if there is any problems with the wire and connection and to cut the wire and to reconnect them, to splice them, you know, the devices that actually do the splicing, you know, connecting the two fibers together to end together, uh, they can cost over $50,000. And it takes a while to really to to um, to make sure that the fiber um, fuse in a matter that are so that the light doesn't escape. Um, so it's expensive to maintain and install, um, and it's hard to troubleshoot sometimes. That's one of the. By the way, the main reason why. Um, Fiber is not used is because the ports, they connect to a ports on the switch. The switches are very expensive. You're talking about close to $100 a port. And if you have thousands of employees, that's going to be very expensive. So you may install fiber in your building, but to get the equipment, especially the switches that moves data, they're very expensive. All right. So that's with that for fiber. And we'll get into the little bit of detail. So very high bandwidth, like I said, no ele no electromagnetic interference, excellent security, no eavesdropping because nothing is emitted outward when the data is traveling. Oh, one more thing I want you to know. How do you send ones and zeros? Well, you can think of it this way. You can send the light, turn on the light for a one, turn it off for a zero, but usually that's we don't do that. So we use frequencies, you know, the um, the red frequency will be a one, which is or the infrared and a different color frequency would be the zero so you send ones and zeros also by the way one more thing another another thing i want you to tie write down under um um well we'll, we'll talk about that when we'll talk about the multi-mode so we'll talk about that in, in a second so again with the drawback it's expensive uh, special equipment to splice, to fuse the cables when they are cut. They could be very expensive. The throughput we're talking about north of 100 gigabits, right? Unaffected by EMI. Okay, so we talked about that. It can go very, very far. All right, the uh, single mode fiber. So there are two different types of modes. Mode meaning a path. Single mode, if you are just sending one frequency one light wave in the fiber so what you wanted that single mode so it's going to take one path you want to send it right in the middle of the core so so that they can travel the farthest distance and doesn't bounce inside the core so it doesn't lose energy so with single mode fiber note number one the core is approximately between five to ten micron very very small right uh, we use uh, lasers as the source transmitters long point number three for single mode is long distance we're talking about close to 62 and a half miles it can travel theoretically bandwidth is pretty high too okay for multi-mode on uh, multi-mode fiber you have a thicker, uh, thicker core, talking up up to 125 micron. And multi-mode meaning you're going to send multiple frequencies in the core. So if you're going to send multiple frequency, you can't send them all in the middle. They have to go. They, you know, some of them have to bounce off uh, on the side of the core, and therefore they start to lose energy. And because of that, the distance is shorter. So we're talking about closer to two microns. I'm sorry, two kilometers, the distance. Uh, but has much higher bandwidth. And another point you should write down is the, um, the we use LEDs. The light emitting diodes are used for MMF, the multi-mode. Lasers are used for single mode. Multi-mode is mostly used for, by the way, data, transmission. Single mode is used for voice. 
All right. Uh, the connectors for single mode and multi mode, uh, it all depends. Um, here's a typical. I remember when one of the exams, they actually showed us these connectors and says, what type of connectors are these? Are they uh, for fiber? Are they for coax? Are they for unshielded twisted pair cable? You just got to be able to recognize the connect, uh, the type of connector. And one more thing, by the way, fiber optic data connections always are always um, full duplexed, which means there's one cable that is dedicated for transmission and another cable is dedicated for uh, receiving. So out of your neck, the cable will have two ends, one to transmit and one to receive, always simultaneously. And that's why you get very high bandwidth. Okay. When you are splicing, when you are putting the two cables together, you want to, you do not want this type of connection because you're going to hit, if the signal comes in, it's going to bounce back. So this type is also no good. And this type is also good. That's why you need the equipment needs to have an exactly 90 degree flat connection and the signal so that this, you have no signal loss. The whole signal, you know, most of it will go right through. So that's why polishing and splicing the two fibers together are extremely important and special equipment is needed for that. All right, so um, single mode will use the straight tip or subscriber connecting. That's for the MMF or also SMF can do that. They use the straight uh, subscriber connection or a straight tip. Lucid connections, they have them too as well. Just need to, I don't know, they don't have pictures of them, but with this, when we take the Cisco course, they do have pictures of the loosened connection of the LC, what the straight tip that has and uh, what the subscriber connectors are. There are converters that will convert fiber to um, unshielded twisted pair medias and vice versa. There are bi-directional fibers. There's the GBIC connectors also that allows you to do that. Here's the uh, here's a typical transceiver that does the 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 connections for you. The small form factor pluggable transceivers that sends and receives, right for the fiber. Uh, here's one connector what you put in the sockets, and you connect the SFP right in there. Typically there are two of them, one to send and one to receive. Right, and here is what we're talking about. The SFP. This is the loopback uh, adapter. That's a tool that you can use to test an SFP functionality. We're not really, we don't have the equipment in class to do any of this, to be honest with you. Okay, going back into this. Uh, remember I told you the last part of the standard name, if it's not a T, or a C, then it's fiber. So FX, LX, SX, SR, SW, L, all of those are fiber. So you'll immediately know that we're talking about fiber optic NICs, which means they will require a fiber optic wires to be connected to them. And here they'll tell you which ones are multi modes and which ones are single modes. Right? So because the distance are long in single modes and because uh, voice requires a small amount of bandwidth, so we'll use the single mode for voice and the multi-mode for data, because data requires a lot more bandwidth than voice. All right, so so that's that. Noise is like I told you before. Noise is mostly um, well. <clears throat> will change the amplitude of the signal. So the, the, the farther the signal travels, the more noise it's going to, the more noise will be attached, the harder we'll be able to detect what the actual data is. So you're trying to avoid electromagnetic interference or any type of signals, any uh, 
any type of wireless signal. So where you're running your unshielded twisted pair cables, if you're running them in the ceilings or in a building, make sure you stay away, for example, in uh, fluorescent lights, they, you know, fluorescent lights do emit enough electromagnetic waves that will interfere with the data. All right, that's called crosstalk. Remember I told you about near crosstalk, the next, the next is right in the beginning of the transmission. If you unwind, excuse me, if you unwind these wires a lot, you're going to have a lot of crosstalk right there. And if you did it on the other end, that's that's the far end crosstalk. So make sure that the connection to the RGA45 is done not, not with a lot of unwinding. All right. Um, attenuation, please write that down because we use that term a lot. Attenuation is a signal strength, the loss of the signal strength as it travels away from the source. It starts to die out. So after a certain amount of distance, you want to have a repeater. Remember we said the, the unshielded twisted pair cable can travel up to 100 meters. If you needed to go beyond that, then you need a repeater because the signal would have attenuated and died out. You need a repeater to regenerate those signals. You need either an amplifier to reamplify the signal if it's analog. We need a repeater to regenerate the signal if it's digital, right? So remember that also. An amplifier is to reamplify an analog signal. A repeater is to regenerate the digital signal. Hopefully, with the, of course, with the same amplitude. All right. So. As you can see, the amplitudes changed with the noise, right? So the amplifier, by the way, even though it attenuates, it will reamplify the noise as well. There are amplifiers out there that will filter out the noise, try to do as much as they can. But if there's a lot of noise, it's almost impossible, right? And here is where a repeater on a digital signal will repeat the signal and trying to clean it up. It's much easier to repeat the signal. If you can tell between a one and a zero, you can actually put out a nice clean signal here. Much easier to filter out noise, but much harder with an analog. Latency, you please write that down too. Latency is the delay between the signal transmission and the receive, receiving, you know, um, how long does it take to reach a signal? If it's taking a long time, there's a delay. Latency will lead just a delay. What causes latency? The cable length, of course, intervening connectivity. If you have to go through routers, by the way, uh, if someone asks you which device creates the highest latency, a hub, a switch, or a router, the answer is a router because the router, uh, the data has to go in. You have to on unwrap the frame, pull the packet out, look at it, decide where it needs to go, and then you have to re-encapsulate it in another frame and send it out. So that creates a lot of latency. So a router has the highest latency. Uh, a, a switch has the least amount of frequency because latency because when a frame comes in, we look at the destination MAC address and send it to its destination um, immediately. So you can actually go through, if you're traveling at 100 megabits per second through a switch, you'll be able to reach your destination at full bandwidth at 100 megabits per second, almost zero latency. RTT, the round trip time, is the time it takes to send a packet and then receive the data back. Um, fiber mismatches, you may have some issues with transmission foam. If you have the fiber mismatches on both ends, you're gonna lose some of the signals. Wavelength mismatches, single mode, multi-mode, uh, plastic of fibers use different wavelengths, so that may be an issue. Uh, dirty connectors, you may use a tone generator to, se to send a small electronic, it's a small electronic device that sends a small signal to actually do, you know, a special tone, you know, send the frequency out, see if you can get the same frequency back. And, and you know, if there's a lot of noise in it, you can use a, a tone locator to actually, you know, catch the signal on the other end. You could do by trial and errors if you want to send out a signal. Here's, for example, a tone locator. You send out a signal using the tone generator, and this guy will try to detect 
that frequency on the other end to see if there's a continuity okay so your tone generator is the one that generates this the wave and the tone locator is the one that detects on the other end to make sure that you have the connection multimeter is you're trying to measure the voltages uh, is there enough voltage power is everything grounded correctly is there an open circuit you know there's a cut in the wire so if you have high resistance you know that there is a cut in the wire if you have zero resistance you know you have a short circuit okay so you use a multimeter to do all of that stuff okay uh, so please write this point for a multimeter you can measure the voltage to verify the cable is conducting electricity you can check for presence of noise verify the amount of resistance is appropriate and test for short or open circuits okay again after you write that down short means zero volts you can say if there's zero volts across the watt across a connection that's a short circuit if you have some sort of voltage that comes up across a connection then you have either an open circuit or you can use check using voltage uh, multimeter meaning you can use the resistance to check for short and open mm -hmm. if the short means zero resistance if you could if you if you probe a wire and it has zero resistance that means you have a short circuit if you probe the wire uh, if you probe both ends and you see a very infinite amount of resistance that means there's an open circuit circuit which means no current is flowing through you can use continuity testers we have those in the lab we can take a look at them we can test those out to, to see if there's a you know you send out a signal and see if if it's received on the other end you can actually use you know audible tones lights to send out and see if the data can go through for on a fiber optic connection as well um here's a typical we, we could actually see some of this and uh, we don't have this but we even have a better one i think in if i'm not mistaken in the lab for a cable tester um, i could have you also set up an rj45 um, unshielded twisted pair cable either crossover or straight through so we can do that as well um let's see the tdr this is really the time domain reflectometer this is specifically for fiber otdr is also measures the fiber length this is issues so i want you to write down these two because they do come up on um, the network plus examinations the tdr issues a signal and measures the signals bounce back for fiber indicates the distance between the nodes and whether the terminator is probably installed and functional otdrs it can measure the how far the length of the fiber if it's if there's if you after you spliced it everything is okay or not but it's expensive so write these points down all right here's these tools are expensive by the way they're not cheap okay these are the for the fiber and uh, the optical power meter is the laser power meter or light meter this is how much light is being transmitted because sometimes if the light is weak it would tell you if you know that means the distance is too far if you can sense that the distance is very far all right so that's that for um, the transmission media and um, until we meet in the next chapter write down everything I told you and um, keep up with the homework and I'll see you in the next chapter.